Deborah Hurley is our next speaker. Deborah's a fellow at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. She's also an adjunct uh, professor of the practice of political science at Brown, and she directs the Harvard University Information Infrastructure Project. Uh, we're very glad to have her here. Uh, oh, right in front of me. Great to see you. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is the seventh inning stretch. Uh, you are stalwarts. You all show tremendous fortitude and interest and attention in this subject. Um, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak. Um, I guess my, one of my takeaways uh, for this afternoon, for those of you in the uh, energy sector, is you know this is yours to lose. Others you already have uh, for over almost 100 years. You've been in households and enterprises, so you're familiar. You have relationships already, and you have trust and of people and coming into their homes or into their businesses. So it's really yours to lose. For now 15 years or so, uh, ICT companies, information and communication technology companies, they're constantly knocking at the windows of people's homes trying to figure out a way to get in. And now with things like Alexa or Google's recent product and so forth, they're finding those ways to get into the home. It remains you know, an area of high interest and actually one of the last areas of some opacity about the activities of individuals as they go about their lives. So you're already in there, and that's a huge advantage uh, for companies in this space, and don't lose it. Again, it's yours to lose. The subject today is securing the smart grid. Uh, I'm all for that, and uh, it's about time, isn't it? When we think about uh, security of information systems, the state of security information systems in general is deplorable, including with regard to the smart grid and the utility sector. Uh, we have known what to do in terms of security information systems, including the grid, for 25 years. I was involved in early efforts in 1989 and 90, doing the first work on computer security. So we articulated then what needed to be done. Those principles remain absolutely valid today, but we didn't do it. So as I put it now, we had the party for 25 years, not securing things, and now we have the big hangover. All this wildly insecure stuff, uh, that we have to deal with, and that includes absolutely the power grid. So when, one of the things that's been mentioned by some of the former speakers, and thank them for that, is what I call, or the classical expression, is protection of personal data and privacy. So much of the data in the grid is personal data. There's plenty of other data as well, but personal data, and that needs to be taken account of. And let me disabuse you of something that's often said, and particularly in Washington, is that we have to balance security and privacy. It's not a balancing at all. In fact, they're mutually reinforcing. By providing better security in an information system, you're protecting better the personal data that is within it. By protecting the personal data in a system sufficiently, then you're overall, you're enhancing the security of the system. Uh, the grid has some particular characteristics, and I don't have time to mention all of them. We'll give you my, my favorite list, but I'll mention a few. Uh, one is obviously it's part of the critical infrastructure, and again, that's a very loaded term. Uh, it sort of leads people off into a rut, but there are real issues there. And it's not a matter of getting a retired general to stand up a, you know, stand up a commission with a retired general and have them hold hearings around the United States. This is just, and we've done this several times very ineffectually, we're issuing some sort of executive order. We've done that also several times ineffectually. This is an issue to really get our arms around and, and something that all of us in this room should be concerned with. Another aspect of the grid in particular is the, the strong presence of legacy systems. So those are need particular attention. Because of the nature of the grid, legacy systems persist and they aren't sufficiently addressed and they become gaping nodes of vulnerability. I'll just give another example too, which is the, uh, the supply chain problem that parts and so forth coming from China or wherever they're coming from, the contracts that are executed to make sure that those things are produced in a way that is has enough visibility and uh, are sufficiently secure. And just let me give you an example. Uh, a Massachusetts researcher some months ago analyzed one of the smart plugs that was for sale in the United States, uh, being marketed in the US as your know, dad's gift. Dad already has too many ties. When you get dad, dad for Christmas, get him a smart plug. It's 40% off at Walmart. Well, one smart plug in particular that was analyzed had a default uh, user ID and password in the hardware. So this is not the only example of that. That is right, and so again, something needs to be dealt with. So let me just also talk briefly again about personal data. So personal data 
is data about an individual that is identified or identifiable. So in the present and coming era with the growth in computing power, growth in storage, commoditization, decline in costs, pretty much everything is identifiable. So don't get caught up in thinking about PII, personally identifiable information, or a new term for me in preparing for this, uh, the CEUD, which is a consumer-specific energy usage data. Don't bother with that. You're just taking yourself down uh, endless and useless cul-de-sacs. If the information is identified or identifiable, it's personal data and needs to be protected. And you can be assured that either now or in the near future, even de-identified data is re-identifiable. In addition, large power companies are being disintermediated. So we need to take account of that looking into the future, not just at the present, but looking at future trends. And I would imagine many of you are, are seized with these things on a daily basis. So rather than so addressing emerging trends, and those include uh, disintermediation of the large companies, a trend again toward decentralization. This is a factor of our area, this kind of accordion of centralization and decentralization. It applies also to the grid. So we now see micro -grid, grids or other things so it's this two-way street that is evolving between the consumer and the energy producer, where you're selling out of your house or out of your car back into the grid and vice versa and so forth. Again, many of you in this room are much more familiar than I am, but this is the optic through which we need to view these issues to be able to come up with reasonable solutions. I'd like to underline through two underlying concepts that I think will help to inform thinking about this as you go forward, and they are the following with regard to personal data in the grid. The first is the locus of ownership and control. And some of the previous speakers have already alluded to that. So who owns and or controls the personal information in the grid? And sometimes the answer is not very clear in the United States. In other countries, it might be more clear. But that's a seizing issue that needs to be uh, decided. So the question is, who is in the driver's seat? And also, too, the personal data may be worth more than the power generation. So it becomes a more piquant question to decide. The other issue is that, the under underlying issue is that of proportionality. Is the solution, whatever it might be, whether it's a voluntary code or a piece of legislation or some company practices the solution in any way proportionate to the problem or the harm that you're trying to solve? Because we often see this using a hammer to kill a fly sort of problems, which ends up creating additional vulnerabilities. I want to emphasize again, although uh, the prior speakers have mentioned this, the granularity of the personal data being collected. So very intimate data about people's activities. Uh, and that can be combined in, in the United States with your health insurance information, your credentials, educational records, uh, employment information, and so forth, and sold on and on. Uh, so it raises a lot of concerns. Where to start? Uh, well, one thing in the United States in the early 70s, which was adopted by over 100 countries around the world, is what are called Fair Information Practices, the FIPS. And so those were articulated in the early 70s and provide good guidance on how to protect personal data. Uh, there are also the limitations, and someone referred orthogonally to them, but they should identify the purpose for which you're collecting the data. The data should only be collected for that purpose, and then it should be used only for the identified purpose. So no phishing expeditions or secondary or tertiary uses without the consent and transparency to the individual whose data is being collected. As far as I'm concerned, voluntary codes of conduct and all that other stuff is useless. Um, you know, I call uh, privacy policies, policies a band-aid over an unwashed wound. You know, if you've got a cut, it's better to leave it open, let some sunlight and air get on it, rather than putting a band-aid over it. Uh, some of you may be familiar, in Norway they have a trend right now, it's called slow TV. Long winters, it's dark there. So there's slow TV where they put on shows for a very long time. So they actually ran recently a 32 hour show where they read privacy policies for 32 hours just to demonstrate sort of the numbingness of the way they numb, numb you in listening to them. Uh, Jay already mentioned the Supreme Court, and I was going to too, so I'll just to build on what he said. Yes, the home is your most protected space. If you get in trouble, go home. That's my advice to all of you because uh, you're most protected there. Uh, but in terms of the Fourth Amendment, we have in the United States something called the Third Party Doctrine from decades ago, which is if you turn over information voluntarily to a third party, boom, the barn doors are open and everybody can use it. But in our increasingly information-intensive world, that's fraying at the edges. And for example, in a recent case, Justice Sotomayor said, you know, maybe we need to re-examine this third 
third-party document. Once we've given information to one person, whether it's the electric company or the bank, it's just open season for everyone. So that needs to be looked at. Jay also mentioned this, I want to underscore that. The justices are, the Supreme Court justices are very inclined to find protection. They go through some tortured arguments in recent years where it involves the home, and especially for things they can relate to. I have a porch, I have a car, I have a phone. We're gonna find the justices, even though they're of an older generation, will find that there are protections there. So that also applies to the types of things that uh, people in the companies in the energy sector will be doing. Um, I just want to mention finally, one of the things that would assist most in the United States today would be the adoption of general legislation to protect personal data and privacy. Right now in the US, we have a patchwork, it's called, that protects certain sectors. I call it a tattered blanket. And one of the problems for companies is that in our current economic era, companies are taking, you know, are moving from their vertical silos and taking on more things. So it'll be a financial services company and a health company and this company and that company. And so they're involved in multiple sectors. They find themselves today subject to this specific sector-specific legislation, but layers of it. So as they try and comply with it, they're actually in violation. They can't reasonably comply with all of it or consistently comply with it. So for companies and for individuals, having uh, national data protection legislation that was clear would be very helpful. My final thing, just to wrap around again, is please handle this personal data carefully because you do have trust and it is yours to lose 